Chapter One of Kari the Elephant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Kari the Elephant by Dan Gopal Mukherjee. Chapter One Bringing Up Kari. Dedicated to my eldest born, Nara. Gopal. Kari the elephant was five months old when he was given to me to take care of. I was nine years old, and I could reach his back if I stood on tiptoe. He seemed to remain that high for nearly two years. Perhaps we grew together. This is probably why I never found out just how tall he was. He lived in a pavilion under a thatched roof which rested on thick tree stumps so that it could not fall in when kari bumped against the poles as he moved about one of the first things kari did was to save the life of a boy kari did not eat much but he nevertheless needed forty pounds of twigs a day to chew and play with every day i used to take him to the river in the morning for his bath he would lie down in the sand-bank while I rubbed him with the clean sand of the river for an hour. After that he would lie in the water for a long time. On coming out his skin would be shining like ebony, and he would squeal with pleasure as I rubbed water down his back. Then I would take him by the ear, because that is the easiest way to lead an elephant, and leave him on the edge of the jungle while I went into the forest to get some luscious twigs for his dinner. One has to have a very sharp hatchet to cut down these twigs. It takes half an hour to sharpen the hatchet, because if a twig is mutilated an elephant will not touch it. When one goes into the jungle one must remember that there are laws one cannot break. Do you know that anyone who is afraid or who hates one of the animals of the jungle gives out an odour which attracts tigers and wolves? Every day that I was afraid to go into the jungle I did not dare to stay on the ground for fear lest the tigers would smell my presence and attack me. I climbed a tree instead, because when one is in a tree the odour of one's body does not go into the forest and the animals cannot tell whether one is afraid or not. It was not an easy job, as you see, to get twigs and saplings for Kari. I had to climb all kinds of trees to get the most delicate and tender twigs. As he was very fond of the young branches of the banyan tree, which grows like a cathedral of leaves and branches, I was gathering some one spring day in March when I suddenly heard Kari calling to me in the distance. As he was still very young, the call was more like that of a baby than an elephant. I thought somebody was hurting him, so I came down from my tree and ran very fast to the edge of the forest where I had left him. But he wasn't there. I looked all over, but I could not find him. I went near the edge of the water and I saw a black something struggling above its surface. Then it rose higher, and it was the trunk of my elephant. I thought he was drowning. I was helpless because I could not jump into the water and save his four hundred pounds, since he was much higher than I. But I saw his back rise above the water, and the moment he caught my eye he began to trumpet and struggle up to the shore. Then still trumpeting, he pushed me into the water, and as I fell into the stream I saw a boy lying flat on the bottom of the river. He had not altogether touched bottom, but was somewhat afloat. I came to the surface of the water to take my breath, and there Kari was standing, his feet planted into the sandbank, and his trunk stretched out like a hand, waiting for mine. I dove down again and pulled the body of the drowning boy to the surface, but not being a good swimmer I could not swim ashore, and the slow current was already dragging me down. 
I clutched at reeds on the shore, but they broke, and the weight of the boy was tiring out one hand while the other was already weak from excessive swimming and clutching at the reeds. Seeing us drift by in the current, Kari, who was usually so slow and ponderous, suddenly darted down like a hawk and came halfway into the water, where I saw him stretched out his trunk again. I raised up my hand to catch it, and it slipped. I found myself going under the water again, but this time I found that the water was not very deep, so I sank to the bottom of the river and doubled my feet under me, and then suddenly kicked the river bed, and so shot upwards like an arrow, in spite of the fact that I was holding the drowning boy with my hand. As my body rose above the water, I felt a lasso around my neck. This frightened me. I thought some water animal was going to swallow me. I heard the squealing of Kari, and I knew it was his trunk about my neck. He pulled us both ashore. As the boy lay stretched on the ground, I recognized the cowherd. He had gone to bathe in the river, had slipped too far out, and, not knowing how to swim, had almost been drowned. I put him flat on his face on the sand, and the elephant put his trunk about his waist, and lifted it gently up and down, then up again. After doing this three or four times, the water began to come out of the boy's mouth, and not knowing what else to do, because his body was cold, I slapped him very hard all over. After that I propped him up against the elephant's leg. Then the boy slowly came to. In the meantime all his cows had wandered away in different directions. As I thought some had gone into the jungle, where I was afraid they might be eaten up by tigers, I sent Kari to bring them back to the river bank. But Kari got lost himself, so when the cowherd had entirely recovered I went to look for his cows and my lost elephant. Where do you think I found him? He had gone right into the forest where I had left the saplings and the twigs, and had buried his trunk into the heap, and was eating the best of them, without any concern for the cows, the cowherd, or myself. But I could not punish him that day, because he had done his duty by saving the life of the boy. Kari was like a baby. He had to be trained to be good, and if you did not tell him when he was naughty, he was up to more mischief than ever. For instance, one day somebody gave him some bananas to eat. Very soon he developed a great love for ripe bananas. We used to keep large plates of fruit on a table near a window in the dining room. One day all the bananas on that table disappeared, and my family blamed the servants for eating all the fruit in the house. A few days later the fruit disappeared again, and this time the blame was put on me, and I knew I had not done it. It made me very angry with my parents and the servants, for I was sure they had taken all the fruit. The next time the fruit disappeared, I found a banana all smashed up in Kari's pavilion. This surprised me very much, for I had never seen fruit there, and, as you know, he had always lived on twigs. Next day, while I was sitting in the dining-room, wondering whether I should take some fruit from the table without my parents' permission, a long black thing, very much like a snake, suddenly came through the window and disappeared with all the bananas. I was very much frightened because I had never seen snakes eat bananas, and thought it must be a terrible snake that would sneak in and take fruit. I crept out of the room and, with great fear in my heart, ran out of the house, feeling sure that the snake would come back into the house, eat all the fruit, and kill all of us. As I went out I saw Kari's back disappearing in the direction of the pavilion, and I was so frightened that I wanted his company to cheer me up. 
I ran after him into the pavilion, and I found him there eating bananas. I stood still in astonishment. The bananas were lying strewn all around him. He stretched out his trunk and reached for one far away from where he was standing. That instant the trunk looked like a black snake, and I realized that Kari was the thief. I went to him, pulled him out by the ear, and joyously showed my parents that it was Kari, and not I that had eaten all the fruit these many weeks. Then I scolded him, for elephants understand words as well as children, and I said to him, Next time I see you stealing fruit, you will be whipped. He knew that we were all angry with him, even the servants. His pride was so injured that he never stole another thing from the dining-room, and from then on, if anybody gave him any fruit, he always squealed as if to thank them. An elephant is willing to be punished for having done wrong, but if you punish him without any reason, he will remember it and pay you back in your own coin. Once I had taken him to bathe in the river. This was summer vacation, and several boys came with me to help. Kari lay on the bank, and we rubbed him all over with sand. Then we went into the water, and most of us began to play. As Kari came up from the water, one of the boys, named Sudu, was standing on the bank. For no reason at all, he hit the elephant three or four times with his whip. Kari squealed and ran away. I brought him home. The next summer Kari had grown so big and fat that I could not even reach his back even when I stood on tiptoe. We used to take him out wherever we went, sometimes one riding on his back, sometimes all walking along with him. We gave him luscious twigs if he behaved well, and sometimes delicious fruit. Once in a great while, as a special treat, we would massage his chest with straw, and he would squeal with joy, and lie on his back as best he could with his fat legs, staring at the sun. One day Sudu was standing on the river bank, where I had just taken the elephant to give him his bath. That day Kari had been very good, so we prepared a straw massage for him. As it was very hot, however, we plunged into the river ourselves before giving him his bath, leaving Sudu and the elephant on the bank. Without warning, Kari rushed at him like a mad bull, threw his trunk around Sudu's neck, flung him into the water, and held him there for a long, long time. When Sudu was finally pulled out of the water and stretched on the ground, he was nearly senseless. When Sudu asked me whether I would punish Kari for having disgraced him in public like that, I answered that the elephant was not rude. When Sudu asked me why, I said, Don't you remember about a year ago? You whipped him for no reason at all, almost on the exact spot where he has just punished you." Sudu felt so ashamed of himself that he got angry with all of us and went home alone. But by the next day we had all made it up, and the elephant had forgiven him. As a proof of friendship, when we went to the jungle on a picnic, Kari carried Sudu on his back. And since that day Sudu has never hurt a living creature. An elephant must be taught when to sit down, when to walk, when to go fast, and when to go slow. You teach him these things as you teach a child. If you say, Dut, and pull him by the ear, he will gradually learn to sit down. Similarly, if you say, Mali, and pull his trunk forward, he will gradually learn that that is the signal to walk. 
Kari learned Mali after three lessons, but it took him three weeks to learn Dat. He was no good at sitting down. And do you know why an elephant should be taught to sit down? Because he grows taller and taller than you who take care of him, such that when he is two or three years old you can only reach his back with a ladder. It is, therefore, better to teach him to sit down by saying Dat, so that you can climb upon his back, for who would want to carry a ladder around all the time? The most difficult thing to teach an elephant is the master call. He generally takes five years to learn it properly. The master call is a strange hissing, howling sound, as if a snake and a tiger were fighting each other, and you have to make that kind of noise in his ear. And do you know what you expect an elephant to do when you give him the master call? If you are lost in the jungle, and there is no way out, and everything is black except the stars above, you dare not stay very long anywhere. The only thing to do, then, is to give the master call, and at once the elephant pulls down the tree in front of him with his trunk. This frightens all the animals away. As the tree comes crashing down, monkeys wake from their sleep and run from branch to branch. You can see them in the moonlight, and you can almost see the stags running in all directions below. You can hear the growl of the tiger in the distance. Even he is frightened. Then the elephant pulls down the next tree, and the next, and the next. Soon you will find that he has made a road right through the jungle straight to your house. End of chapter 1